and also someone who has been deeply engaged in developing novel methods of observing such systems and really pushing the limits of data analysis to eke out the subtle but really important signals that we're all so, so keen to, to learn about. Um, Heather uh, began her studies at Johns Hopkins and then was a PhD student um, at the Center for Astrophysics, uh, where among other achievements, she made the first map of an extrasolar planet, of the thermal emission from such a world. Um, she was then a Miller Fellow at Berkeley for a couple of years, and then moved on to a professorship um, in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences, uh, where she has been since uh, 2011. Um, so uh, Heather, we're really looking forward to your talk. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, wonderful. Uh, so it's great to see a lot of familiar names and, and faces. I, I know we all wish that we could do this in person, but uh, we take what we can get these days. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to be back, if only virtually. We are in a really fortunate position uh, these days because uh, in the years since I left Harvard, um, we've gotten really good at finding planets around nearby stars. And so we, we have the luxury now of um, trying to make sense of this embarrassment of riches. So we know of many thousands of planetary systems orbiting many thousands of stars. And one of the sort of big questions is, um, we, it's obvious from looking at the architectures of these systems that many of them have planets that don't exist in the solar system. And they have sort of architectures that are very different than the architecture of the solar system. And so one of the kind of big overarching questions that uh, we'd like to address in the field is the question of, you know, assuming that everything starts from a disk of gas and dust, what are sort of the forks on the road uh, that lead you to produce a system like our solar system versus some of the systems that we're going to talk about today? So um, can we look at the present day properties of exoplanetary systems and tell stories about where they came from and kind of where, why one and not the other? So if we want to uh, study exoplanetary systems, uh, we first have to ask how we find planets around nearby stars. And in my talk today, I'm going to focus primarily on planets which were discovered using the transit technique. So uh, this is when, um, the, this is actually a video of, of Venus transiting the sun, um, but the same technique uh, works equally well for other stars. So when we see the planet pass in front of the star, it blocks part of the star's light. And by measuring that dimming and brightness, we can infer the presence of the planet. We know something about the size of the planet relative to the size of the star, and we know something about its orbital period. And so those two pieces of information together already tell us a lot about the architectures of planetary systems. So the um, sample of planets that I'm going to be discussing today, um, in part, uh, really sort of uh, owes its, its heritage to the survey um, run by the Kepler telescope. So Kepler looked at a single 100 square degree patch of sky for nearly four years continuously. And its goal was to detect transiting planets um, orbiting a sample of about 150,000 roughly sun-like stars. So it was tremendously successful. We have many thousands of planets and planet candidates uh, detected by Kepler and continue to have more from K2, the extended Kepler mission, and also from the test survey, which is ongoing now. Um, one thing that became obvious sort of even in the early years of Kep Kepler was that most planetary systems don't look like ours. So if we focus on the inner regions of these planetary systems, uh, we can see that the solar system is relatively empty. So we have Mercury close in, then we have Venus and Earth a little bit further out. And so in this uh, cartoon, I've made the sizes of the planets to scale, and I've made the distances to scale, not to the same scale, otherwise it would be much harder to see the planets. But just to give you a relative sense for the, the structures of these systems. One other important thing to mention, I'm, I'm zoomed in on the inner parts of these systems because that's really the region of parameter space that transit surveys probe in order to see the planet pass in front of the star. 
um, that requires the planet to be sort of aligned along our line of sight. And that's much more likely for close in planets. Their orbits can have a larger, larger range of orientations and still pass in front of the star. And it becomes less likely as you move further out. So transit surveys are really good about telling us about the inner architectures of planetary systems. So here's the inner part of the solar system. And we can compare that to a couple of representative exoplanetary systems. So um, one is a system of closely packed mini Neptunes. The system is Kepler 11, was one of the first uh, confirmed planetary systems from the Kepler survey. And you can see that there are many planets in the system inside the orbit of Mercury. And you can also see that all of these planets are bigger than the Earth or Venus. In this case, we know their masses from uh, transit timing variations. So um, by looking at the dynamical perturbations between planets. So we actually know that these planets have low densities and that their large radii are due to the presence of hydrogen rich envelopes. We also see close in planets, um, which are primarily rocky. So in a good example of that would be 55 Cancri E, uh, not discovered by Kepler, but uh, orbiting a very bright uh, naked eye star. And so that's another great example of a planet which is much bigger uh, than even the terrestrial planets in our own solar system. So we see in general from the exoplanet surveys that um, large rocky planets close in are quite common around sun-like stars and that many of those planets have uh, volatile rich, hydrogen helium rich envelopes. And both of those things um, make those planetary systems very different than the terrestrial kind of solar system planets. We can look at this in a more sort of quantitative way. And the best way to do that is to show you a histogram of planet occurrence versus planet size. This is again only for close in planets with orbital periods less than 100 days, because that's the region of parameter space for which the Kepler survey is uh, fairly complete. And uh, this particular distribution uh, is from Fulton et al. 2017 and was updated with Gaia measurements for the host star properties in 2018. So this is sort of the, the more quantitative version of the picture that I showed you before. We see that gas giant planets, which have radii that are about 10 times the size of the Earth, so on the far right in this plot, we see those planets are fairly rare on close in orbits, although they do exist. But as we move to smaller sizes, you see that um, these planets, which are larger than the Earth, but smaller than Neptune, Neptune is about four Earth radii, that those dominate the population of close-in planets. Another really surprising feature of this distribution is that it's bimodal. Uh, there isn't a single typical radius for these close-in planets, that there are two. And the sort of present understanding of that um, bimodal radius distribution is that it's actually a bimodal composition for these close-in planets. That the smaller peak uh, corresponds to planets which are primarily rocky, and that the bigger peak is a population of rocky planets similar to the small peak, but with the hydrogen helium envelope on top, which increases their radius. The gap between these two uh, peaks is often referred to as the evaporation valley. And it's worth noting that um, this feature was predicted in advance of its discovery by the Kepler survey um, by Owen and Wu and also by Lopez and Fortney. And uh, it's still a bit open to debate as to what the sort of mechanism is driving the mass loss, but uh, the, the basic picture seems to be a very good match for the observational data that you have rocky cores and those rocky cores either keep or lose hydrogen rich envelopes. Uh, as a sort of test of this theory, we can look at the population of planets from Kepler in two dimensions. So we can look at the planet size versus the orbital period. So in this picture, we expect that the smaller planets, which in this framework should have lost their hydrogen rich atmospheres, we expect those to be preferentially located closer to their star. And sure enough, we see this um, smaller radius peak is a bit closer in. And then we see that the larger planets are typically located a little bit further out. And that's consistent with the idea that these are planets which were able to keep a modest hydrogen helium rich envelope. So that story makes sense, um, but it is a story which is entirely based on planet radii 
and orbital periods, because for the vast majority of these planets, we don't actually have measured masses. So we can't definitively determine whether or not they are rocky planets or lower density planets with volatile rich envelopes. If we want a sanity check on this, the very sort of first sanity check we would like is exactly that. We'd like to go and measure masses for many of these planets. An obvious place to start is to look at the population of very close in purportedly rocky planets, um, both because they're easier to follow up, they have larger RV semi-amplitudes when they're close in, but also because those are planets which the sort of mass loss theory very strongly predicts should have lost their atmospheres. And if it can't get it, if we can't get it right for those planets, then the theory is definitely not going to work for the other planets in the population. So here's a plot um, from recent work by Fei Dai, um, who's a postdoc at Caltech. And this plot um, shows the sort of latest set of mass and radius measurements for very close in planets. So these are things that are um, typically have orbital periods of less than a day, typically have radii ranging between one and one and a half times the radius of the Earth. And you can see that when you measure masses for those planets, that they um, fall very nicely along the line for a body which is a mixture of rock with a modest amount of iron, presumably in a metallic core. And this composition is very similar to the composition that we see for the Earth. So that seems to be a nice confirmation of this idea. Now I'll point out that um, some of these planets have relatively small error bars. And those error bars are small enough that they don't actually lie on this rock iron line. And in particular, I'd like to highlight 55 Cancri E, which was the planet I mentioned a little bit earlier on in my cartoon. So that planet looks a little bit less dense than we might expect for a rock iron mix. And if you look at the literature, there are conflicting pieces of information that suggest that it either may or may not have um, a, an atmosphere on top of the rocky surface. So one of the things that um, we can do is we can try and observe this planet in transit and we can try and infer uh, the presence or absence of an atmosphere. Uh, in this case, if this planet has an atmosphere and if that atmosphere has hydrogen and helium in it, um, it should be escaping. That's useful because uh, the escaping gas will sort of occupy a larger area around the star. So what we can do here is we can measure the transit depth when the planet passes in front of the star and we can do so at different wavelengths. We might look at a wavelength where that escaping atmosphere is transparent, then the planet will appear small. But if we look at a wavelength where that escaping atmosphere is opaque, then the planet will appear much bigger and its transit depth will be much larger. Um, in particular, we might be interested in measuring that transit depth in, um, at wavelengths where hydrogen and or helium absorb strongly. Uh, Lyman Alpha would be a great wavelength to look at. So this planet was observed back in 2012 by David Ehrenreich. They observed a transit when it passed in front of its star, um, looking with Hubble in the Lyman Alpha line. And you can see their data there in black. The transit depth is a function of wavelength. Uh, the middle part of the line is grayed out because we can't see that part of the line due to absorption from the interstellar medium. So we can only look for absorption in the wings of the line but these observations suggested that there was no absorption. And therefore um, that's been, this is probably the strongest piece of evidence to date that um, maybe this planet, despite being a little bit less dense than the other short period planets, um, doesn't seem to have uh, an atmosphere with much if any hydrogen in it. There's a catch though. Um, if you do 1D hydrodynamic simulations of escaping hydrogen helium atmospheres, um, Sols et al. did this in 2016 for 55 Cancri E. Those models indicate that um, plausible outflowing atmospheres could still be the, below the detection threshold for this measurement. So the blue dashed line shows the predicted Lyman alpha absor um, absorption signal from one of these 1D hydrodynamic models. And you can see that because you can't probe the line core, that even this relatively strong single signal is still consistent with the non-detection in the wings of the Lyman alpha line. Fortunately, um, Lyman alpha is not the only line that we can use to probe escaping atmospheres. So just a couple of years ago, a really exciting development, um, there was a, both a, a theoretical advance and also an observational advance where 
um, uh, folks realized that the metastable line of helium at 1083 nanometers can also be used to probe outflows. Um, it should be noted that Sarah Seeker pointed out the utility of this line 20 years ago, um, but it wasn't until two years ago that it was detected observationally and uh, that the theory was really worked out in detail. So um, this has really kind of opened up uh, a lot of exciting opportunities to study mass loss because this is a line which is in the infrared. Unlike Lyman alpha, which requires UV observations from space, we can do this from the ground. It's also really exciting because this line is not blocked. There's no interstellar medium absorption or even telluric absorption, at least not significant telluric absorption that overlaps with this line. So unlike Lyman alpha, we can use helium to probe um, escaping material which has low velocities, so things at the line core. So this can be a more sensitive probe of mass loss for some planets than Lyman alpha. Uh, Michael Zhang, who's a grad student in my group, uh, decided that um, this might be a good opportunity to uh, try and understand what was going on with 55 Cancri E. So last year we observed two transits of 55 Cancri E with Keck near spec, and we looked at this metastable helium line to check for absorption during transit uh, due to an escaping atmosphere. One other nice thing about looking at helium is that we can also consider not just the possibility that this planet has a hydrogen rich atmosphere, we can also consider scenarios in which the hydrogen has been preferentially lost, leaving a helium dominated atmosphere. That would also be consistent with some of the observational data. And um, as you can see from the blue and orange lines, the predicted absorption depth during transit for both the helium dominated and the hydrogen dominated models are very similar. And they both predict, predict quite strong, easily detected absorption. As you can see from the black points, we did not detect any absorption. And that allows us to place uh, quite strong limits on the presence of both a hydrogen and or a helium dominated atmosphere. Okay, so going back to the um, size radius plot, you can see that 55 Cancri E is relatively large for a close in rocky super, but it is also um, extremely close to its host star. So it's maybe unsurprising that um, it seems to have lost any primordial atmosphere that it might once have had. Nonetheless, it is reassuring uh, that that planet seems to be in good agreement with the models that we use to explain this sort of population of planets. Having established that, it would be really cool um, to look for present day mass loss rates for planets spanning a range of orbital separations and a range of radii. That would be a really good test of the mass loss models that are used to explain this, these sort of two populations of planets. Uh, in order to do that, um, a really great way to do that would be to do a survey using this metastable helium line. Lyman alpha is great as far as it goes, but because of the interstellar medium, you can only detect Lyman alpha from extremely nearby stars, and you're also um, preferentially looking at younger stars which have stronger Lyman alpha emission. So if you want to do a big survey of a relatively old population of planets around distant stars, uh, metastable helium is a more sort of better suited tool for that kind of survey. Now, if you want to do a survey, um, you have to think about what's the most efficient way to do it. And the 55 Cancri E observations that I showed you were obtained using Keck. Um, it took a half night of Keck time because we have to observe for approximately twice the duration of the transit. Uh, for longer period planets, that can increase to up to a whole night of telescope time. And so you can kind of see that this is not really well suited to doing a survey of a large number of planets. Uh, we don't really want to do this on a big telescope like Keck. There are um, other groups who have made helium measurements on mid-sized telescopes, so sort of three to five meter class telescopes. But there are a couple of factors that sort of limit their ability to do these surveys. One is that um, on smaller telescopes, they're limited to relatively bright stars. For example, the Carmenes spectrograph um, can only make these helium measurements for stars brighter than about 10th magnitude. And also, these instruments, um, you have to take relatively long integrations which means that if you think about a transit light curve, it means your time sampling of the shape of the transit light curve is relatively poor. The integration times can be sort of on the order of five to 10 minutes. 
which is not great um, because there might, we'll talk a little bit later, there might be some interesting shape information that tells you about the outflow as well. So um, two years ago, right when this helium uh, stuff was first coming out, we were trying to think about a wet, better way to do this helium survey um, that would be sort of well suited to a mid-sized telescope, but be more efficient. And um, the idea that we came up with is that we could, instead of using a spectrograph, we really only care about light in a very narrow range of wavelengths. So we could ditch the spectrograph and we could instead use a custom narrowband filter centered on the helium line. And we can install this filter in an existing infrared camera at Palomar. And that um, can give us some, a much more efficient way to make these helium observations. So here's just a quick sort of schematic of the setup that we have at Palomar. And I should mention, this was actually not my idea. Um, one of the really awesome things about having a great group of grad students is that um, they, they also, they read the literature, they come up with great ideas, and then they come and tell me about those ideas. Uh, so in this case, the narrowband filter was an idea that um, Shreyas Visipragata came up with. And um, so he came and, and described it to me and uh, I got really excited, this is awesome. And it's easy, we can buy a filter, we can put it in an instrument uh, and we can do it fast. So we were able to order the filter, install it and commission it um, in about six months. And so this was really kind of a fun project from my end because we were able to put it together so quickly and be on sky. So uh, the basic idea here, we have an infrared camera called Work on Palomar that we've been using for a number of years now uh, to do space quality IR photometry. I'm not gonna talk much today about how we do that, except to say that we um, spread the light out um, from each star into a, a very stable kind of broadened point sped function using an engineered diffuser in the optical path. And that that allows us to um, really kind of stabilize how things behave in time. And we're able to get higher quality um, infrared photometry than some space telescopes. We do a factor of two to three better than Spitzer for most of the Kepler stars. And if you want to read more about that, um, I would encourage you to look at uh, papers by Gumi Stephenson and Shreyas uh, Visipragata. Okay, so we have the engineered diffuser already. We're pretty happy with our infrared photometry. Now we just need to add a narrow band filter uh, centered on the helium line, and we can make helium light curves of these transiting planets. And so on the right is just um, an image from uh, one of our helium filter uh, sequence of observations. You can see that the um, target star, which is the green circle, is on the upper left. Uh, we have a couple of comparison stars, which are circled in black. Uh, the narrowband filter, the effective transmission varies across the detector array. So the rings of light that you see are actually um, OH emission lines. And I'd be happy to talk about that later for anyone who's curious. But for now, I'll just say we do comparative photometry for several stars in the helium line, and that gives us really nice transit light curves. Okay, so um, this is a transit light curve from our first night on sky, which was August uh, of 2019. And this is observing a hot Jupiter, WASP-69b, which had already been observed previously with an um, infrared spectrograph. We wanted to see if we could dupl duplicate the spectroscopic um, helium measurement with our photometric filter. Uh, the broadband optical transit of this planet is shown in blue, and in red is the best fit transit light curve in this narrow band path centered on helium. So you can see that the planet appears much larger in the helium line. That is because it has an escaping atmosphere uh, which makes an outflow. That outflow is optically thick in the helium line, and so it makes the planet appear bigger during the transit. So the, the a magnitude of the difference between the optical transit and that helium transit tells us something about the rate at which the planet's atmosphere is escaping. Uh, we detect the outflow at 10 sigma, so it's a nice strong detection. You can see our time sampling of the transit is very good. And uh, our observations agreed well with the published observations from Carmenas for this particular planet. So that was very reassuring as well. Uh, since then, we've been doing a survey of um, a sample of about uh, a dozen or so, actually getting closer to 20 
uh, transiting gas giant planets. So the idea is to survey the helium outflows for gas giant, short period gas giant planets. Uh, this is just an example of, of two of the light curves from the program. Uh, the one on the top uh, is a star which is, uh, I think about 12th magnitude. It's the faintest system with a metastable helium detection to date. So one of the nice things about doing this photometrically is we can go to fainter stars than those mid-sized spectrographs can access. And we get a really nice uh, time sampling as well. On the bottom is another gas giant planet, which um, really should have had an outflow. Uh, it's, it's a similar mass, similar, similar orbital distance. Uh, it looks very comparable to many of the other planets in our sample, yet there was no outflow detected. So um, there's still a lot that we don't understand about outflows around these planets. And that brings me to sort of the broader point of, um, I kind of sold this as we're going to do a survey of helium uh, looking at these small close and super mini Neptunes. And then I kind of pulled a little bit of a bait and switch and said, ah, no, we're surveying gas giant planets first. And so you might ask, why, why do gas giant planets? And the reason for that is that um, it's much easier to detect these signals around gas giant planets. And as a result, these make really good test cases for the models that we use to interpret these observations. So it's imp important to point out that it's actually non-trivial to go from a magnitude of absorption in the metastable helium line to a sort of density of helium to a mass loss rate. And that going from the metastable helium absorption to those other quantities requires a detailed knowledge of the radiative transfer that's going on in the sort of exosphere region. So you need to know a lot about the local temperature and density structure, about the UV flux from the host star, about the different ways that the metastable state can be populated and depopulated. And although we have models that describe that, um, there's still a lot of kind of areas where uh, our, our models are either speculative or are uncertain in some way. And so looking at gas giant planets provides a great way to test those models to make sure that we can accurately interpret the absorption lines that we see. The other reason that it's interesting to look at gas giant planets is uh, at high signal to noise, we can start to look for things like asymmetries in the outflow. Uh, some models predict that um, these out, this outflowing material can form a comet-like tail. And we see that as sort of an asymmetric transit light curve with an extended egress. If we can measure the shape of the transit light curve very well, we can compare the absorption that we see to the predictions from 3D models that capture the sort of um, asymmetric shape of these outflows. And there's a great example of, of the 3D modeling uh, from a recent, in a recent pair of papers um, by Lila Wong and Fei Dai that just came out a couple months ago. Okay. So we can use gas giant planets to make sure that we get our modeling right before um, really kind of diving in to do the survey of, of smaller planets. But in the meantime, we can also take a slightly different approach, um, which is we can go to sort of the opposite extreme. So I started by talking um, about very close in rocky planets. And I gave you the example of, of observations of 55 Cancri E, which was uh, this, this very short period, very massive super Earth. But we also see planets at sort of the other extreme. So we see planets which are a little further out, um, part of the sort of mini Neptune population. But those planets have, some of them have very extremely low densities. And so just to kind of um, show that schematically, uh, we can measure mass loss around hot Jupiters. Uh, but what we typically find is that the mass loss rates are small. So although these objects do lose mass, it doesn't, it's not a significant fraction of their total mass when you integrate over their lifetime. So the mass loss is kind of negligible for the bulk properties of the planet. Similarly, um, when we look at sub-Neptunes, sub-Neptunes are typically further away than hot Jupiters and their hydrogen and helium, helium envelopes are much smaller. They only have only a few percent hydrogen by mass. And uh, Although it's hard to detect mass loss for sub-Neptunes right now, our mass loss models predict that they, their atmosphere should be relatively stable. So if they're losing mass, it's, it's again kind of a negligible factor in their overall evolution. Some planets, though, um, when we look at their masses and radii, they have extremely low bulk densities. 
which implies that they have hydrogen rich atmospheres that are not a few percent by mass, but rather more like tens of percent by mass. So that um, is shown sort of to scale on the, the bottom here. And when you calculate the predicted atmospheric lifetimes for these super pups, as they're termed, and this was a, a term originally coined by Eve Lee and Eugene Chet, who first identified these objects in the Kepler sample, you kind of run into a problem, which is that the predicted atmospheric lifetimes for super pups, in their, given their current day orbits, are extremely short. So we understand why hot Jupiters survive to the present day. We understand why sub-Neptunes survive to the present day. Neither of them are losing or should be losing very much of their atmosphere. But we don't understand how super puffs can exist. We see them around relatively old stars. So this isn't some transient phenomenon. Somehow these planets must be able to kind of exist for billions of years without losing these very tenuous, very extended hydrogen-rich envelopes. And that's been kind of a puzzle for the mass loss models. So it's difficult to observe these planets directly, either in Lyman Alpha or in the helium, metastable helium line. Um, the stars are typically quite faint. The planets are small relative to the stars. But we might be able to look for other sort of clues that would help us to understand the super puffs, kind of where they came from and how they survived to the present day. One of those clues is uh, to try and look at the compositions of their atmospheres. So super puffs, as we see them today, orbit in, well inside the sort of primordial disk ice line of their host stars. If they formed close in where we see them today, um, they probably incorporated some rocky solids into their envelopes. So we might expect to see an atmospheric composition that reflects those sort of locally available materials. But um, in the Li and Chang paper, um, they argued that these planets had to have formed beyond the ice line. And the reason for that is just sort of simple um, accretion models suggest that you just don't get that much hydrogen and helium unless you're further away from the star where things are cooler and also where the gas is relatively dust free. So there are special conditions needed to form super puffs. And those special conditions are probably only met outside the ice line. So um, in that paper, they proposed that super puffs probably formed beyond the ice line and then migrated inward to where we see them today. If they did form further out, we might expect that any solids that they created are, are relatively ice rich, and that should give them a, a different atmospheric composition than we would see if they had formed close in. So if we could detect some of these um, solid materials incorporated into their envelope, um, which would be things like looking for CO or methane, uh, materials like that. We might be able to infer something about the elemental abundances in their envelopes and therefore something about where they formed. How do we do that? Uh, we use the same technique that we've been using to study mass loss, which is to say we measure the wavelength dependent transit when a planet passes in front of its host star. But this time we're doing it over a broader range of wavelengths in the infrared. And we're searching for absorption from things like water, methane, carbon monoxide, and other sort of common strong infrared absorbers uh, that might be present in these planets' atmospheres. We do that by measuring the transit depth as a function of wavelength. So this just for sort of visualization is um, the uh, transit light curve for a hot Jupiter HD 209458 across the whole range of optical wavelengths um, as measured with Hubble. Uh, it, I show this mainly to point out that the shape of the transit light curve um, also depends on the limb darkening of the host star, so that you see at the very shortest wavelengths, it's much more sort of smoothly varying, and then as you go to longer wavelengths in the red at the top, you see it becomes more box-like. So in order to make these measurements, we also have to have a model of the stellar atmosphere, and we have to understand the limb darkening properties of the host star in order to back out that wavelength dependent size for the planet. Okay, so what's our target? Um, in this case, um, there's a super puff in a system called Kepler 79, which was originally published by Daniel John Top Potter in 2014. Um, this system kind of has all the hallmarks of the uh, mini Neptunes that are so common around nearby stars. So we see that it has four transiting planets um, all quite large compared to the terrestrial planets in the solar system. 
those four planets are in a chain of resonances, which means that um, they uh, dynamically perturb each other's orbits. And we can study those dynamical perturbations using the transit timing variation technique. And we can use that to solve for their masses. So that was done in this um, original paper in 2014. And you can see that the masses of these planets um, don't really match up with their radii. So the most massive planet in the system is close in. It's 11 Earth masses. And then I want to draw your attention to planet D here, which is actually has a radius which is twice the size of Neptune, yet it has a mass which is a third the mass of Neptune. So this planet is a great example of that sort of class of planets called super pups, that it must have very small rocky cores surrounded by um, sort of tens of percent of hydrogen and helium, which inflates its radius. So we can observe this planet when it passes in front of its star, and we can measure the wavelength dependent transit depth, and we can try and look for absorption from different molecules. Uh, this was um, a study done by Yeyadi Chachin, um, who's another grad student in my group. Uh, so Yeyadi looked at data from Hubble, which span sort of 1.2 to 1.6 microns. Those wavelengths span uh, strong absorption bands from both methane and water both of which could easily be present in this planet's atmosphere. Uh, we had some predictions going in for what we thought we might see. So in red, you see the predicted transit depth as a function of wavelength for a planet which has a solar metallicity atmosphere and no clouds. And you can see that it has very strong um, variations as a function of wavelength. That's primarily due to water. Um, as you increase the metallicity of the planet's atmosphere, uh, you start to shrink the amplitude of these variations. So the blue model is for a very metal-rich atmosphere of a thousand times solar, sort of at, at the very opposite extreme. But uh, also, these planets might have clouds. So the green model is for a model which is still solar metallicity, but which has a very high optically thick cloud layer. And you can see that the black data points um, have no detectable absorption. And so they can be matched either by the very metal rich atmosphere model or by a model which has a high cloud layer. So we were trying to detect um, the sort of molecular, the gases present in this planet's atmosphere to figure out where it might have formed. Unfortunately, we don't detect any absorption from the gas, but um, it does tell us something about the properties of its atmosphere. So what does it tell us? Uh, we know that this planet has a very low bulk density just based on its mass and radius. So we can estimate the gas to core ratio in the limit where it's a rocky core and then a hydrogen and helium envelope. And you get um, values which are something like the envelope is 30 to 40% of the core mass. So that's just like to scale what that looks like. So you have a metal rich core and then you have an envelope which is many times the radius of the core. Uh, you can use that mass and radius to place an upper limit on the metallicity envelope. So if we imagine grinding up that core and mixing it throughout the envelope, we can ask what's the highest metallicity we could possibly have in the atmosphere and still be consistent with the measured mass and radius. And because this is such a low density planet, that upper limit is actually pretty tight. So this planet must have an atmospheric metallicity that is at most something like 140 times that of the sun. And this is based on models from Daniel Thorngren and Jonathan Fortney. Okay, so going back to my previous plot, that blue model that I plotted was a thousand times solar. So we can rule that model out as being inconsistent with the low bulk density of this planet. It just can't be that metal rich and match the mass and radius that we observe. So that leads us to conclude that uh, the other model is probably the right one. So um, in this case, based on the temperature of the planet, which is relatively cold, it's only about 600 Kelvin, it is very plausible that the atmosphere might host photochemical hazes and that those photochemical hazes could easily mask the signature of absorption that we would have expected to see. And there's a number of, of good um, models that predict the sort of formation of these hazes uh, and also just to sort of draw an analog to our own solar system, these would be similar to the uh, photochemical hazes that we see on Titan, for example. Okay, so um, we didn't learn anything about where Kepler-79 formed, but we did learn 
that its atmosphere has um, a high altitude haze layer. And that's really interesting from the sort of perspective of super puffs because it offers us a solution to the problem that I highlighted at the start, which is how these planets could have survived to the present day without losing their very puffy extended gas envelopes. So the answer is that um, when we calculate predicted mass loss rates, we measure a size for the planet based on the transit depth. And we have to associate that radius with a pressure. So we say the planet at this wavelength, you know, has a size of three and a half Earth radii. That optical depth equals one corresponds to a pressure of typically 10 millibars if you look at um, models for mini Neptunes. But if the planet has a high altitude haze layer, that haze layer makes it appear bigger than it would otherwise for the same atmospheric mass. So we can sort of flip that around and say, what is the pressure in the atmosphere at which it becomes optically thick for a super puff versus a typical sub-Neptune? And when we include those hazes, that optically thick pressure is 10 microbars. So there's a three orders of magnitude difference in the sort of um, optically thick pressure that directly translates into a three orders of magnitude change in the predicted mass loss rates. So there's a nice series of papers on the theory side from um, Lila Wong and Fei Dai from 2019, also Peter Gao um, from 2020, uh, that show that if you account for the effects of these hazes and making the planet appear puffier and bigger than it actually is, once you correct for that, you get much lower mass loss rates um, that are in much better agreement with the present day ages of these planets. So the answer to the mystery of um, why these planets exist and how could they survive without losing their atmosphere, uh, the answer turns out to be that they didn't have quite as much or as extended of an atmosphere as we originally thought that we were fooled by the presence of these hazes. And so in addition to Yayati's study on Kepler 79, there's also another um, paper by Jess Libby Roberts that looked at another pair of super pops around a younger star and also found that those super pops seem to be hazy. So that story seems to be holding up well when we look at it, a sample of, of several super pops. Okay. All right, so I've spent almost all of my time today uh, talking about mass loss and whether or not small planets keep or lose their atmospheres. But in the remainder of my time today, I wanted to briefly mention one other important piece of the story, which is um, why we get such large cores close in in the first place. So if we just accept by fiat that um, large rocky cores exist close to their star, then it's pretty straightforward to imagine that those accrete hydrogen and helium, that they lose or keep that helium depending on their orbit. But when we tell that story, um, we have to start at the beginning and ask, where did those rocky cores come from in the first place? So why do sun-like stars so easily um, end up with very large rocky planets close in? And uh, the answer to that might have something to do with the other planets in these systems. So in the solar system, we have our four outer gas giant planets. And there are models which suggest that those planets um, might have migrated into the inner solar system and back out again. Uh, that's a model called the Grand Tack by uh, Walsh, I think it is 2011. Anyway, um, the idea is that uh, the, our giant planets, the presence of them and the fact that they moved around might have influenced the reservoir of material available in the inner disk to form the rocky planets that we have today. So the reservoir of material and also the timing with which those planet form might depend on what's going on in the outer parts of these planetary systems. So just to sort of restate that more generally, um, if you have an outer gas giant planet, it could restrict the flow of solids to the inner disk. It takes a lot of solids to make a super earth or even multiple super earths. So having a gas giant planet might be something that suppresses super earth formation. Uh, having a giant planet can also um, affect the sort of dynamical state of the inner planetary system. So you might um, excite the orbits of the small bodies, make collisions more frequent, make it harder to grow the cores. After the systems are formed, you might destabilize inner systems of super-Earths and eject some of them. 
So uh, you can imagine also that dynamically, an outer gas giant could be disruptive to super Earth formation in the inner system. Lastly, um, it may be that the outer gas giant doesn't, in most cases, directly influence what's going on in the inner disk. But the presence of an outer gas giant planet does tell us something about the properties of the protoplanetary gas disk. So we know that gas giant planets are preferentially found around more metal rich stars. So their ability to form is sensitive to sort of the mass budget of the disk. And so their presence can place constraints on the protoplanetary disk properties. So if we look at super Earth systems in the first two versions of this story, we would expect super Earths to be anti-correlated with outer gas giant companions. So if gas giant companions are bad for super Earth formation, then they should be relatively rare in super Earth systems. Whereas in the bottom scenario, if both of them form more easily in a metal rich disk, we might expect there to be a positive correlation between the two that we find often systems of super Earths and gas giant planets together. And so we can actually um, go and look and ask which of those scenarios matches the sort of facts on the ground. So the Kepler survey, as I mentioned earlier, really only tells us about the inner parts of these planetary systems for two reasons. One is that the duration of the Kepler survey was only four years. You need to see at least two transits to know that there's something there and know its period. So Kepler can only go to a little beyond the orbit of the Earth. The other reason is that as you go further out, the probability that the planet transits its star, get, it decreases. So by the time you get out to Jupiter's orbit, the probability of seeing a transit for such a distant object is extremely small. Those two things together mean that we have a great census from Kepler of super Earths and mini Neptune systems, but the Kepler data alone don't tell us anything in most cases about whether or not there's any outer gas giant planets in the system. Fortunately, um, we have other techniques that we can use to search for outer companions. In this case, radial velocity is a great approach because it doesn't depend so sensitively on the orientation of the planet's orbit with respect to us. And also radial velocity is convenient because we can do it from the ground over an extended period of many years or even decades. And we can more easily build up the long baselines that we need to see very distant uh, long period gas giant planets. So what we want to do is we want to use radial velocity techniques to try and follow up systems with known uh, close in super Earths and to search for the presence or absence of outer gas giant planets. So um, just as a reminder, um, the Doppler technique that we're using here is just we're measuring uh, the motion of the star towards and away from us induced by the orbiting planet. Although we typically want to look for many years so that we could see a whole orbit of the planet, in this case, um, we were impatient and we wanted to try and do this a little faster. And so what we realized is that we don't actually have to see a full orbit of the planet to know that there's something there and to know that it's relatively big. So it's enough for the purposes of just counting gas giant planets to have a baseline that samples a subset of the planet's orbit. And that tells us already that there's something there if we see a radial velocity acceleration. And the slope of that acceleration tells us something about the minimum mass and the minimum period of the planet. So we can use this technique to find out uh, that there's something there and that it's likely a gas giant planet or even a low mass star. Uh, this is a project that was the final part of Marta Bryan's thesis work. Uh, so this is something that she finished uh, just two years ago, but we're continuing to work on today. I'm not going to go into detail about what Marta did. Um, I'd refer you to her paper uh, if you'd like to learn all the details, but instead I'm just going to jump directly to the answer. So if we imagine sort of a scenario in which you have outer gas giant planets, we can think of two possible inner architectures. So we could either say you have an outer gas giant planet and that tends to make the inner planets small. So that's the sort of solar system analog case. Or we can say you have an outer gas giant planet and that outer gas giant planet is uh, sort of closely linked with uh, very massive planets. So we ask what's the relative probability of these two different kind of forks uh, for the inner architecture. <clears throat> 
So what MARTA found is uh, that when you survey a sample of many close in super Earths and mini Neptunes, about a third of those super Earths and mini Neptunes have outer gas giant companions. And that is a surprisingly large number because outer gas giants aren't that common sort of globally. Um, only about 10% of sun-like stars have Jupiter analogs around them. So the fact that 30% of super Earths and mini Neptunes have Jupiter analogs means that um, there's a very close positive correlation between outer gas giants and inner super Earths and mini Neptunes. So we can rule out from that list that I gave you before, we can rule out the first two scenarios where outer gas giants are bad for super Earth formation. And we can instead focus on the third scenario where um, either the outer gas giant in some way actually promotes the formation of inner super Earths or whether the two are correlated because they preferentially form in certain kinds of protoplanetary disks, for example, those that are more massive or more metal rich than average. Okay. Um, and just to sort of point out, um, it's, it's a great observational correlation and um, there have been a number of, of follow-up theory studies that have come out in the two years since we published that paper, which have explored some of the sort of mechanisms by which you might get this observational correlation. So if anyone wants to dive into the why, um, I would refer you to those papers. Okay, so just to kind of wrap it up, um, let me remind you of kind of the three uh, approaches that we talked about to understanding these uh, unusual, at least surprising uh, and very common planetary system architectures. So um, I asserted at the start that close in planets that are a bit smaller have lost their hydrogen rich atmospheres. We did a case study of 55 Cancri E to confirm that picture, even in the case of a relatively large and slightly lower density than expected super Earth, that that still seems to um, fit in well with the story that that uh, 55 Cancri E does not in any way have a hydrogen or helium rich atmosphere. We also went the opposite extreme. So we looked at the um, lowest density, most hydrogen rich planets that we could find, these um, distant super pops. And we talked about how um, they might have been able to keep their atmospheres, even though when you do the quick sort of back the envelope calculation, they seem to be too puffy to have survived the present day. Uh, so we've shown how the presence of hazes can explain uh, can reconcile their mass loss rates with sort of their uh, perceived lifetimes. And lastly, I just kind of touched briefly on the idea that um, if we want to understand why these very relatively massive rocky planets are so common around other stars, that it's really important to know what other planets are in the system, in particular, to know whether or not there are outer gas giant planets, because these outer gas giant planets um, can tell us something about the primordial disk properties and can also influence uh, the evolution of the inner disk and the forming planets within it. Thank you, Heather. That was great. Okay, uh, wonderful. All right, so I, this is my first time hosting a colloquium in this format. So let me go over and then invite everyone. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand or uh, and then I'll invite you to, to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question directly. If you prefer, or if you have low bandwidth, you can just type it in uh, to the chat and then I'll, I'll ask uh, Heather on your behalf. And I should mention, uh, I know it's almost 5 p.m. your time, but I am happy to stick around a little after the hour for any folks who wanna stay and, and chat for a bit or have extra questions. Okay, um, all right, so let's see here. So Sam uh, Quinn, please go ahead. All right. Hi, Heather. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a question about Kepler 79. So you pointed out the work showing that photochemical hazes might be able to reconcile those sizes and ages and mass loss rates. But it's one planet in a system of four, all with similar masses, and it's not an interior or exterior planet. So I was wondering if the fact that this has hazes and the others don't tells you anything special or if that's consistent with predictions of you know, temperatures at which hazes are likely to form. You could... Yeah, um, 
there, even with the hazes, super puffs are still much more hydrogen rich than typical sub-Neptunes. So um, that sort of 1% envelope versus 10% envelope, even after you correct for hazes, it's still true that they have envelopes that are more like 10%. So there's a real compositional difference between Kepler 79d and the adjacent planets. Uh, it's pretty easy to explain how being further out could allow you to create more gas. So it's, I think it's pretty easy to say D should, is, is, can be bigger than B and C. But I think the tough part, as you point out, is that there's a planet exterior to that one, which is smaller. And if they all formed further out and migrated in, that outer planet, you know, if, if Kepler-79D was beyond the ice line, the outer planet should have been too. And so why is it not as large? And that's an interesting question. And I don't have any good answer except to say, maybe there's other planets in the system that might have um, affected the growth of that outermost planet a bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Next uh, was uh, James. Uh, Kirk, go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, hi, Heather. Thanks for a great talk. I was wondering about your uh, helium survey with the ultra narrow band photometry. I was wondering among the 20 planets or so that you said you've observed, whether you've observed any correlation between either the host star spectral type or the host star's activity level and the amplitude of the helium absorption that you observe. Uh, so there's a prediction by Antonia um, based on the radiative transfer models that the helium, metastable helium is only, is most efficiently populated for K stars. Um, I would say we have mostly focused on K-stars in our survey, so I don't know that we really like have tried to push that too far. Um, uh, we do see, I think, some correlation between activity level and magnitude of absorption. So I, I think the story about why there are different helium transit depths among different gas giant planets for those orbiting K-stars, I think it is ultimately gonna be a story about the radiative transfer and how, um, depending on, for example, the density profile of the atmosphere, high gravity planets can have, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to picture the Sols et al paper um, had a really nice uh, sort of plot of this. Um, the ionization fraction of helium is different um, for different surface gravity planets. And that might be a factor in explaining the variations. So Thank you. That, that was the idea is that um, we can get the radiative transfer right if we have a large sample of planets and can understand sort of the pattern in the helium absorption that we see. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is uh, Razi, uh, Imami Mebadi, please. Hi. Thank you so much. That was very excellent. Uh, I have a question regarding to the atmospheric loss when you consider the orbital create versus the planet size. I was wondering if we consider very eccentric orbits of the planets, uh, is this any like the degeneracy or like any better chance that for those that their semi-major axis is still far away but are very eccentric, there will be better chance of uh, atmospheric loss or have you already taken this into account? Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of good statistical studies that show that most of the close-in planets detected by Kepler seem to have relatively low orbital eccentricities. So a typical super-Earth or a typical sub-Neptune is going to be on a relatively circular orbit. The gas giant planets that are close-in can sometimes have more eccentric orbits, the sort of warm Jupiters, but um, those are so massive that they're not losing much of their atmosphere anyway. So being eccentric or not isn't going to make too much of a difference for them, I think, at least in the present day not talking about tidal heating or anything like that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, if there's any other questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, I wanted to know, okay, so, so Heather, you covered a lot of ground. You talked a lot about um, the effect of, of, of photochemical hazes or some kind of particle um, and the fact that it was at a very low pressure, um, I think you said 10 microbar, I, uh, and, that would, and that would change our understanding of you know, where the mass is distributed in the envelope and therefore how much is able to escape and so on. 
I wanted to hear your thoughts about um, what are the prospects for actually figuring out the composition. Uh, you know, hazes have 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 been an, a really interesting discovery. In some ways, they're a bit of a hindrance, obviously, to learning more about the atmosphere. What are your thoughts about what they're actually made of, um, and how we might um, learn more about them and even see through the hazes at certain wavelengths? Just looking ahead to other 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 ways of continuing to push deeper into exoplanet atmospheres. Yeah, so that's like the story of the last five or 10 years is we thought we could measure all these gas absorption signals for transiting planets. And at every turn, we have been foiled by clouds and hazes. Uh, and it's made it much harder than we had hoped it would be. For the specific question of super puffs and these photochemical hazes, um, you can imagine a couple different types of photochemical hazes, but um, all of them become more transparent at longer wavelengths. So if you looked with JWST in the mid infrared, you might be able to see through the hazes. And you might also be able to detect wavelength dependent scattering that tell you directly what the composition of the hazes are. So it's interesting kind of for both of those reasons. So uh, if, if, if I could suggest what JWST should observe, that would definitely be, I think the most interesting thing to look at mid infrared. Now, uh, let's see, we've got a question from Charles Alcock, and I want to note something that unites you, me, and Charles, which is I think we all started at the Center for Astrophysics in our respective positions on the same day. So <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. So um, all right, uh, Charles, please go ahead. Okay, well, I'm going to go and expose my ignorance here. How do you distinguish between clouds and hazes? Uh, so I guess the quick answer is we don't observationally right now. So all okay. we see is that there's a source of scattering opacity, mm -hmm. kind of a gray scatterer. Maybe if you get enough wavelength range, you can say something about the wavelength dependence and the particle size, but like, again, not anything that tells you about the particle composition. Mm -hmm. So the argument for photochemical hazes is primarily one on, based on the temperature of the atmosphere. There aren't any condensates that would be present in the upper part of that atmosphere based on sort of what would be present in a reasonably, you know, in enough abundance to make a decent amount of clouds. Whereas photochemical cases, um, the models predict uh, there should be relatively abundant in the, at that pressure and temperature for that kind of planet. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next is uh, Sofia sanchez Myers. Please go ahead. Hey, um, I was curious about the relative density of these close-in like mini Neptunes versus our actual Neptune. Um, yeah, I don't remember offhand what the average density is, but that's maybe not the more interesting thing. So I think you might, maybe the more interesting thing is to ask what the sort of relative mass of the core is compared to the mass of the envelope for these sub-Neptunes versus Neptune. So I think for Neptune, it's roughly comparable mass in the envelope and in the core. Whereas for these sub-Neptunes, it's about 1% mass in the envelope and the rest in the core. So the envelopes are, are much, much smaller as a fraction of the planet mass for these guys. Okay, that's um, the motivation behind my question um, was because we talk so much about migration in terms of explaining close in hot Jupiters, but in the case of maybe a migrating actual Neptune, uh, you might anticipate some amount of like atmospheric mass loss in greater in greater amounts because it's a smaller planet harder to hold on to right. So is that a viable explanation for these mini Neptunes. Oh, could they have had more massive envelopes that were stripped off? Yeah. Um, yes. So um, there, so James Owen has really been sort of a pioneer in this area. And if you look at his papers, there's a nice review from 2018. Um, he argues that there's sort of, um, if you have a bit more envelope than the sort of mini Neptunes that you tend to lose it until you get to that few percent value. Um, yeah. But I think 
most Neptunes don't lose very much mass. So they're, um, it's unlikely that you could take a Neptune and strip off so much mass that you could turn it into one of these mini Neptunes. Do we see Neptunes at the same radii at which we see mini Neptunes? Yes, there are definitely close in Neptunes as well. So that would be another argument against that. So a really well studied example is GJ 436. And it has mass loss rates measured both with Lyman alpha and with the metastable helium. And it's losing gas, but not that much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think uh, we have covered all the questions. So um, uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to say, Heather, it's really been an absolute pleasure to have you uh, give the talk today. Uh, we had a huge turnout. Also, I noticed a number of names from other institutions, and that was great to see. Um, and uh, uh, we very much look forward to when you're able to visit the Center for Astrophysics and the Boston area again in person. But until that time, we really appreciate you giving a talk over Zoom. Happy to do it. It was great seeing everyone. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Heather. Yep. All right. Take care.